We're looking today at continuing our series of lessons on staying faithful. And today we're going to look at the topic of perseverance. We'll get to that in just a moment. There are many practical applications when we study about how we need to stay faithful. We looked at four different things before today. First of all, we talked about our allegiance. Where is our allegiance? It is our primary, unquestioned, first allegiance to Christ. If we have that attitude, that makes it much more uh, manageable, much easier to stay faithful when we remember where our allegiance really is. There's only one allegiance that's superior to all others, and that's our allegiance to Christ, to God's Word. And that means also that we have to obey in order to maintain that allegiance. Someone who claimed allegiance to a certain uh, country, to a certain group, to, let's say, even being part of a certain military force, and yet did whatever he felt like doing, wouldn't really be showing allegiance. And a lot of people treat they're following Christ in that way. They can do some good things, but then other times they can do what they want to do. It doesn't matter. That's not allegiance. And we must have a greater allegiance to Christ than worldly things. It, um, more than our allegiance to money, more than our allegiance to friends, more than our allegiance to family. Things that are not evil in themselves, but Christ has to come in first place. We also talked about the twin ideas of discipleship and discipline. Are we truly going to be a disciple following Christ in all things? And are we going to accept the training of the Lord, the discipline that he wants us to have? So we have to live in the word and do what he says. We also, as part of being a disciple, need to love other disciples and seek to make more disciples. We also have to be willing to suffer. Someone who runs away at the first sign of suffering has no discipline. We need to train ourselves to be more and more what God wants us to be. If we compromise the truth, then we don't have any allegiance to the truth. If we compromise our discipleship, well, we really can't be Christ's disciple plus some other disciple. We have to make a choice about what comes first. We also study the idea of covenant. And with the covenant, we think of ideas like our promise before God, what we have given our highest word to do. Now it's true that if we promise that we're going to be faithful to God, yes, we ought to be faithful to God. That's true, I wouldn't argue with that, and yet there's more to that. We look at being faithful to God's covenant. Yes, we need to do what it is that we have agreed to do. We willingly enter into this covenant, the new covenant that Christ came to grant. But also there's God's covenant love. That is something we see abundantly throughout the Old Testament, even a word that seems to indicate that. And also that concept is held throughout the New Testament. God loves us in that covenant. It's not a matter of if I make a contract with some business, then I'm legally expected to uphold it because that's, that's the law. More than that, God loves us and has shown us that through all that he has done in the covenant has gone abundantly beyond just the, well, I'll give you a chance and if you fail and it's broken and everything's done. God's covenant love is so much greater and we need to respond to that with the love of our own. If we do that, it makes it much easier to stay faithful. And the ultimate covenant love is personified in Christ, his perfect life, his sacrificial death and still working to help us today. Covenant love seen exemplified in Christ. We also have looked at the idea of sacrifice. And as we saw even in the burnt offerings and other offerings given in the Old Testament, a sacrifice is something that's set apart for God's use. We use, you use words for sacrifice like devoted. Something is devoted to be destroyed as part of an offering to God. That's very serious. You don't devote something and then just take it back and do whatever you feel like. You use it however you want to. And the person who is devout has a life that is given to that service to God. The dedication, when something's dedicated to God, is given to God, and it's not something that you just pull back or change your mind about. We need to be devout. We need to be dedicated in our life, living according to the word that God has given, so that our lives are a living 
sacrifice. <laughs> but a sacrifice requires a full commitment. It's not just tossing off something we had a little extra of. It's not making a promise that we might or might not keep depending on how things go. And sacrifice changes us. What we sacrifice for, we love. What we love, we sacrifice for. And those things build on each other in a virtuous cycle. When we truly give from the heart, it changes us. And we need to do that in order to stay faithful. Otherwise, we can find our service being compromised, becoming empty, being something that is not what the Lord requires of us. It does not correspond to the love God has shown for us. Let's go often, let's go now to our fifth lesson, and that is on the topic of perseverance. When people speak of perseverance, a lot of times you'll see this where people are discussing biblical things. There is a, a doctrine that many people attach to it. And in Reformed or Calvinist theology, when people say perseverance, they often refer to a teaching that everyone who is a believer, who is a true believer, will always keep trusting in God, will always do good work to obey Him, related to, well, you can't fall away, you can't be a Christian and then fail. That's a lot of times what people mean by perseverance. Now, this is interesting to me, because when we talk about perseverance in an ordinary everyday sense, we think of someone who is continuing to make an effort to do something, someone who doesn't quit, someone who is always trying to work to be the very best at this, and that is perseverance. The person who tries something and commits to something and then gives up and forgets about it doesn't have that kind of perseverance. The person who kind of backs off and gives up when things get hard doesn't have that kind of perseverance. And in the everyday speech that we use, if someone really was committed to something once but now isn't, we wouldn't use the word perseverance, although a lot of people in a religious sense say that's how it works. What we see in the Bible, and this is not just from the way we use the word, but from how the Bible uses this word and related words, when it speaks of having perseverance or patience or endurance, or steadfastness, you'll see any of those words and perhaps some others depending on your translation, even when a lot of them come from the same Greek family words. But when we speak of having those things, we indicate that we have to make an effort. We are choosing to act in this way. We are keeping up our commitment by making the effort to serve, and it's not something we give up on, it's not something we pull back from. It's not something that we abandon or neglect, but we keep doing it. That's not only how we often use the word every day life, but it's also how what the Bible tells us we need to do to remain in the right relationship with God, to continue to be justified, right, pure, before Him. This is something that we'll see. So in our lesson today, we're going to see how the Bible teaches us this, but we're going to do it in a couple of different points. We're going to look at what should motivate our perseverance, and that alone tells us about the need for it. We're also going to see what this, keeping this perseverance, continuing to make the effort to serve faithfully, what it does for us, and also we'll look at how it is required of us if we want to be right with God. Let's look at our first point first. What is going to motivate our perseverance? And let's look at 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 7. And in that passage, in the whole chapter about love, we see what's required of us. Chapter 13, verse 7 says that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We need to be willing to endure all things because of the love that we have. Love for who? Well, first and foremost, love for God. If we do that, we are going to endure all things. So our love for God must motivate our perseverance. But if we go a couple of chapters further over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at the end of that chapter, verses 57 and 58, 
says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's a whole lot to be said in this chapter. In this chapter, Paul deals with some people teaching or saying, promoting some, some idea that we aren't going to be resurrected after this life. <coughs> Paul says, no, we are, and we have a hope. And that is going to motivate us to continue to serve, to be steadfast, to not be moved in these ways. And so when we think of what's being said there, we know that the Lord helps us. We know that we can have the victory through Christ. We know that God has not stopped caring for us. That should motivate us to continue to serve Him. So when times are hard, or when Satan is working to pull us away from our faith, we need to remember we stay faithful, motivated by love, and by a trust that God will help us and care for us. And if we go over to Matthew chapter 15, we see a woman, a Canaanite woman, or Mark 7 calls her Syrophoenician, which would be the same area there, and she, her daughter has a demon. And she comes to Jesus asking for help. And he doesn't say yes immediately. Verse 25, then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And your daughter was healed from that very hour. You know, one of the things I think about when she says, even the dogs, she's not put off by that, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, I think, what great humility. And, and yes, she had humility. There's no doubt of that. But what does Jesus say is motivating her persistence in asking even when she wasn't told yes right away? Oh, you have great faith. And so our faith needs to motivate our perseverance, even when we don't get what we want all, all right away. Her faith, her trust in Christ was central to being able to follow and receive what she had asked for. Now think about what we've said here about what motivates our perseverance. And when we talk about having confidence that the Lord will help us, that's, that's pretty closely tied to hope, isn't it? Faith, hope, love, those are the things that motivate our first year. Those are the things that help us to stay faithful. If we will continue to be working at each of these things, if we continue to hold fast to what we believe and trust in the Lord for all these things, faith and hope and love, along with some other related things that we've been talking about, are going to motivate us to persevere and stay faithful. Let's also look at what perseverance does for us. We already have the greatest reasons to continue to persevere, to endure, to keep on serving. But what does it do for us? Let's look first at a couple of parables, or parts of parables, over in Luke chapter 11. And verse 5 through 8 is where we're going to start. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 11. At the beginning of this chapter... Jesus teaches about prayer, and then says this in verse 5. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give them as many as he needs. Now the following verses tell us to keep asking, seeking, knocking. Again, without the word there, persevering is in the idea of continuing to do those things. And yes, God will do that because God gives good gifts. He's better than some friend who's busy, who's already in bed, and doesn't want to maybe create a disturbance by getting up. And, what, and not like the friend who would really rather he just went away. God is not like that. Instead, God is there to lovingly give us what we need. But we don't get everything. 
right away do that? Because God is acting for our benefit by having to show perseverance, by praying repeatedly, by continuing to ask and trust as we do those things. By doing those things, we are growing. We're growing in our perseverance. And that's what God wants us to have. Sometimes we don't get what we ask for right away. But if we persevere, we will receive the promised blessings and will grow as a result of those things. In Luke chapter 18, we read about the unjust judge. At the beginning of Luke chapter 18, the first uh, the purpose of this is said in verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought, all, always ought to pray and to not lose heart. Talks about a widow who is seeking justice and the judge is not interested in that, but the widow keeps asking, so he'll go ahead and grant what she has asked for. Verse 6. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge? His own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? When we have to persevere, it's not that God doesn't care. It's not that God can only be moved to help us through wanting not to be bothered. This is a contrast with God's love toward us. But what we see is that when we keep asking, when we keep doing what we should and keep asking God, then we grow in faith. Requiring us to persist is one way that God allows us to exercise our faith. If you think about somebody, maybe if, maybe you could think about an athlete, a tremendously gifted athlete, for whom everything has always come easy. He's always been the best of those around him, always been on the winning side, and maybe gets to a new level and his team doesn't do well. And he wants to quit. Well, the person who would act like that or the person who would be angry about that or cause trouble about that isn't showing maturity. Hasn't had to learn to keep on keeping on. Hasn't had to learn to persist. When we keep asking those things, then that's one way that we, we can grow through the exercise of our faith, having to persevere. God will do justice, and it will not be grudging, and it will not be slow in his schedule, but when things need to be done. Although as people, finite creatures, it might seem that way to us, but God will allow us to exercise our faith in this way. Look over with me at Romans chapter 5. And verses 3 through 5. Romans chapter 5 speaks more directly about what a perseverance causes us to have. It says, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Just like we were talking about a minute ago. Uh, the tribulation produces perseverance. If we want to get perseverance without ever having to go through anything difficult, well, it's not going to work like that. But notice what perseverance does bring. Character and hope. Perseverance produces these things in us and helps us to be the kind of servants that God would want us to be. And look over at James chapter 1. Again, we see this kind of building up that happens with perseverance as one of the building blocks. Starting in verse 2 of James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But that patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You ever been dealing with problems? Serious problems. And you might say, you know, falling down a flight of stairs would be more pleasant than dealing with this. I felt that. And yet, God doesn't want us to fall down the stairs. God wants us to work through those problems in the way that he has told us to. And when we do that, we can grow, have the right kind of character, have hope. And we see it causes us to be complete. It causes us to be mature if we 
are faithfully doing what God has told us to do and not giving up, not bailing out, but continuing to do what is right. We can build up ourselves and have those things. A few pages afterward in 1 Peter, again we see what perseverance does for us, what it can cause us to have or to show that we have. Verse 6 of chapter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while it need be you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when we persevere, this allows us to have a genuine faith, and a faith that brings praise, honor, glory. When we persevere, if we expect our whole life never to be challenged, never to have to deal with anything unpleasant, we're not going to grow. We're not going to be mature. Might be like a baby who can crawl, but when it comes time to walk at about a year old, and I don't see the need to do that. What if I fall down? I have. I can get around. I'm fine. I'll just live my whole life like this. If a baby did that, that would be a bad thing. But spiritually, we don't want to <coughs> cause ourselves to fail to develop by running away from problems or ignoring them instead of dealing with them and persevering through them. Turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 16 through 18. In a slightly different way, we see what this is doing for us in another in one of Paul's letters. It says, starting in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So in this passage, we see, yes, we have to go through this, and it doesn't feel like it at the time, but it is a light of God that's not giving us more than we can handle. And it's for a moment, for a limited period of time, but it brings us to the point we can share in eternal glory, and eternal weight of glory emphasizes how great that is. Yes, perseverance allows us to be able to partake in that as well. And one more thing that perseverance does for us is said over in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 25 through 27. Lamentations 3 is so neat that the 66 verses and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet being used in a special way is constructed in an amazing way in itself. And as we kind of get to the midpoint of the book, about verses maybe 21 through 30, 32 or so, in the middle of the middle chapter of the book, really just bring a lot of things together, and I find them very useful. Let's start reading verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks them. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Now this is only part of a much bigger chapter. But it's good to have to deal with things. It's good to have to work through things and wait for the Lord. Well, perseverance, if we look at the rest of the chapter, it shows us some things about what is a benefit from dealing with some of these things. We see, first of all, that perseverance shows us we have hope in the steadfast love of the Lord. In verses 21 and 22, that is something that is brought out there. Perseverance, later on in the chapter, about verses 31 through 33, we see that we can trust. Trials won't last forever. They won't last forever. And God doesn't want us to suffer pointlessly. And then... When we look at that, we also, at the end of the chapter, verses 58 through 66, we see that God will repay those who are evil for their sin. When we persevere, bear the yoke, deal with our problems, then we can grow and trust in these ways more and more. We can understand that God's love better, trust Him more, have confidence in the future if we persevere. If we fail, and we won't be able to gain these kinds of blessings that help us, like we read earlier, to be perfect and complete. Perseverance also is necessary. 
if we want to please God, and if we want to be saved. It, it's strange, as we mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, that a lot of the people who speak about perseverance the most mean, ultimately, that you do not have to continue to obey God to remain saved once you have the faith. Even if you fall away, many people will say, you, you cannot fall away, you cannot ever fail to serve God, to, to please God. You will never be lost once you have truly believed in Him. And they call that perseverance. But what we see is that the perseverance of making the effort to serve God, to be faithful to Him, to follow His Word, it's necessary to be saved. We have to keep obeying Him as long as we have the ability to in this earthly life. We need to keep doing that. That is not to say that salvation is a result of human effort alone. Not at all. It's not because we persevere so much that we're going to be saved. It's because God is merciful and forgiving. But he does expect us to live in a way that continues to honor him, that continues to obey him throughout our lives. Look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. With me, please. We go to the parable of the sower. Luke chapter 8 and verse 15 gives part of the meaning of the parable. It says in Luke 8, 15, But the ones, the seed, that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Now, if we're good soil, we'll bear fruit, but what do we need to do that? We need patience. We need endurance. <coughs> Whatever word you're version they have there at the end of verse 15. We're going to have to keep obeying and be patient about it. If we think that God really needs to give us all of our spiritual growth now, then we have failed to learn something about perseverance and what's required of us. Now that's the good soil. Those are the people who will be saved. You'll notice that in the parable there are other people when it was on the stony ground, when it was on the, the ground with the thorns, the thorny ground, there were other people in whom the word, God's word, the seed, went down and sprouted and started to grow, but failed. Not the word failed, but people failed. Because their faith was very shallow, and they'd fall away. Or there were cares of this world that would grow and choke out that word, and it would not bring any fruit to maturity. Those people heard the word, they believed it, and the word was growing in them, but it didn't produce fruit to maturity. And so while they had believed the word, they ultimately didn't keep obeying it, they didn't persevere, and they would not be the ones that God approved. Think also of John chapter 15, where it talks about the vine and the branches. If anyone does not bear fruit, especially in verses 5 and 6, that branch withers cut off and burned. Now that picture is not picturing someone who's saved, but lost, even though that person had been part of the vine, had been attached to Christ. But they didn't persevere, and so they failed. We must bear fruit with patience if we want to be right with God, acceptable to Him. Some people believe, but they don't bear fruit, and they will not be acceptable. Let's go over to Romans chapter 2. And verse 6, Romans 2, verse 6, it speaks about the judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, or wrath. Verse 7, at the heart of it, makes it really clear that only those who continue to patiently obey or endure through this life are the ones whom God will accept. Others who don't keep obeying, who seek themselves instead of continuing to seek Christ, they will not be acceptable to God. We must continue. We must endure. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, we're admonished to keep doing what is right. In Galatians 6 verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We can't grow weary. We can't lose our resolve if we want to have eternal life. And over in James chapter 1 and verse 25, 
it talks about what we must do if we want to please God there as well. Chapter 1, verse 25 says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You want to be a continual doer, pers persevering in obedience, if you want to be blessed. And the verses surrounding it show that if you're not continuing to do, you're deceiving yourself. You're not going to be right with God. But over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verses 10 through 13, we see another reason why perseverance is necessary for salvation. 2 Timothy, let's start by just reading verse 10. It says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul personally was enduring, persevering, and that would also help others in addition to himself. Then we read verses 11 through 13. This is a faithful saying. For if we die with him, we shall live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. If we endure and not deny and not fail, then we will be blessed. If we want to reign with Christ, if we want to experience that blessedness for eternity, we must persevere throughout this life. And going over a few more pages of Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews warns these people that they need to continue to, even though they had done some, some things that showed a great deal of trust and obedience in the past. Verse 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward, for you had need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. In a number of ways, the writer is telling them, don't go back, don't draw back, don't give up on Christ, don't go back to the lesser life that you were living. And again, in Hebrews, we're not talking about going into you know, paganism, we're not talking about immorality being something that would necessarily have characterized a previous life. But even those that have been brought up as Jews. They couldn't go back into that way of life without Christ without losing everything for eternity. That's part of the big message of Hebrews. This is superior. You need to keep following it. And that perseverance is shot through even here. You have need of endurance, verse 36. Now these are people, as you read in verses 20, 32 through 34, who in the past had been a spectacle there were ways that they were exposed, ridiculed, made fun of, it seems the saying there, and also that they had lost some of their possessions because of that. And we aren't told precisely how they had done it. But if you have someone who is willing to be exposed, be made a spectacle because of their faith in Christ, and willing to give up their possessions because of their faith in Christ, those same people are the ones the writer is saying, you need to keep enduring. Now let's say that your faith had cost you your house. We might say, well, that's, that's a pretty big commitment. You, you, you think, that's a pretty big commitment. Yes, it is. But that didn't exempt them from continuing to need to go back. They needed to go on. They needed to persevere. And if they didn't, if they drew back, that would be destruction, not salvation. So the writer is telling these Christians, you need to persevere to receive the promise and to preserve their souls. They need to, need to, we need to. And so we've seen in a number of ways how the New Testament shows us that we need to persevere to please God. Not only do we need to show perseverance, but also we need to realize that the Lord has shown these related qualities, patience with us, long-suffering with us. This is something that we talked about in a couple of our lessons. 
for instance, in the idea of covenant. We see that covenant is not all, covenant is not only about what we have promised to do, but what God has lovingly done for us their own time. That's the reason to stay faithful and not just what we have promised to do, but that's important. And when we think about sacrifice, yes, God wants us to make sacrifices and doing what God says regarding sacrifice will help us to be faithful. That's true. But we look at the example of God's own sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross for why we need to be faithful. And so when we think about why we need to be faithful and persevere to stay faithful, we realize what God has done through for us, which is far greater than anything he asks of us. Look with me, please, at 2 Peter chapter 3. And we'll start to read over in verse 9. 2 Peter 3, starting verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering toward us. It isn't that he owes us anything. It isn't that somehow our goodness has obligated him to put up with us. Wouldn't make sense. But God has chosen to continue to offer us that opportunity to be saved. And even after we have known his truth, the forgiveness, when we repented after our sin, he's done that for us. He's shown that long suffering. And of course, this has been shown ultimately at the cross. What God has been willing to go through for us. What God has been willing to endure for us. And look at verses 14 and 15 of the same chapter. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Now that diligence, blamelessness, that also points toward our perseverance and what we do. Verse 15. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. It's also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, is given to you. Yes, God's long-suffering is our salvation. So when he asks us to endure, we know that he's endured infinitely more than we have. He's not asking us to do anything. He hasn't done abundantly more. He has shown the greatest patience toward us. We cause the problem, but he has suffered for us. And finally, Hebrews chapter 12. We were not far from here a minute or two ago. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see the admonition being given. After the writer has shown them you need to persevere, after he's given them all those examples of faith, and without that word necessarily being there, examples of great endurance by people of faith. Chapter 12 of Hebrews starts this way. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Endure, endure, endure. Over the past year, I've tried to take up more running. And what's been neat is that I've been able to see myself grow and do it. That's good. But you know what? It's still not easy, isn't it? As you seek to grow, as you seek to improve, as you seek to have a healthier heart and you know make your overall life better, it's hard work. Spiritually, it's even more important to put in the work. Now, there are lots of people here who are much, much better at distance running than I am. And that's okay. But every single one of us should want to be building up our spiritual endurance in this way, knowing that we have a race to run. We have a spiritual race. And it's going to take endurance. It's not a 100-yard dash. It's not something where it'll be all over in just a minute or so. It's something that, as we have lived the Christian life, it's something that's going to take our continual effort. But Jesus has already shown that greater endurance. 
Jesus has come to earth and lived that perfect life and given himself as that perfect sacrifice, self-sacrifice on the cross for us, endured the persecution, endured the physical pain, endured everything for those decades that he spent on the earth and now has become that perfect example and even now continues to intercede on our behalf. He's done that for us. So why wouldn't we want to stay faithful to him through the life that he has allowed us to have here today? He asks, he has given, I've written that wrong, he's given far more perseverance. He's shown that to us than he demands of us. He has demonstrated far more perseverance than he asks of us. And the Christian life is one of perseverance. We talk at, in our sermons about how to be saved. And we made the point that yes, of course, you need to hear and you need to believe the gospel. You need to obey what God has said. And that includes repenting of sin. And that includes confessing Christ. And yes, being baptized with forgiveness of your sins. All of that is commanded. But we have tried to be very clear, especially in this lesson, that obeying God and all those things, it's not a one-time uh, commitment that you never have to be concerned about again. It, the baptism into Christ is the beginning of a life dedicated to Him. And we need to keep obeying Him. If, when you become a Christian, that's the beginning of a committed life. And if you are a Christian and you haven't had that kind of commitment, pray to God for forgiveness. Repent. Resolve to do what is right. And if, for instance, you wanted us to pray for you, you want to confess that, pray for you, we'd be happy to do that because we all want to be right before God. We know it takes commitment. We know it takes endurance. And we know that we all depend on God's mercy for that. We're here to help each other. There are many times in athletics, like we talked about, where having someone that helps you makes all the difference in your performance. And it's true in the Christian life. It's not something where we're saying, well, you know, I want to run farther than you, so I don't care about you. I just want to be first. No. This is the kind of race we run together. We endure together. And when we do that successfully in life, we are promised, and we know it's true, that we'll reign together with Christ. That's what we want. Open your song book to the song that's been sung. But this world is not our home. So we endure looking for another home beyond this life. We have to endure in this life to get there. But we're looking for a heavenly home. We want for everyone to be having that perseverance, to be staying faithful. If there's any way that we can help you spiritually, like you just described, we stand eager to do so. Since this world is not eternal, it's not our eternal home. Make sure you're putting that the next world first. Make sure you're obeying Christ. And if we can help you with that now, please come to the front as we stand.